because they are modern. And when you look at it, you find that they care about their tradition, which we don't so much. For example, this is a chief justice from which country? We can just guess, looking at the attire. A British colony, former British colony, Uganda, chief justice. The same clubbing. So that tradition perpetuates so much that it even influences the colonies. And this is again not from 1600s or 1700s. This is the opening of the parliament session. It's a ceremony. And can you see all these figures? You know, the, the boys on the left, the cardinal and the other guys, etc. They are clad all in the same way. <coughs> so tradition matters so much, even the modern ones uh, you are using uh, that tradition. And when you look at BBC, which is seen as the objective, uh, a very, you know, number one journalism example in the world, they carry out their broadcasting in so many languages now. These are foreign languages that BBC is broadcasting. Why? Are they so fond of giving objective news to all these people? Are we speaking? Are we speaking? Are we speaking? So the British are sacrificing themselves and wealth just to say, well, let the people know the truth. We are dying, really. Now, where are we coming? We are coming to the point the identity may be so made up to be a bite-faced identity. On the, on the one hand, they preserve their own historical traditions, etc., etc., but on the other hand, they are really into hard politics, like BBC exemplifies. In Turkey, there are still people who say, oh, I listen to BBC Turkish broadcast, because it is much objective, much more objective. And that objectivity is coming from these facts. BBC, has 20,000 employees in a uh, capitalistic market. This is a huge public sector employment. They usually resent. But BBC is such a strong arm of British imperialism still today that they can employ so many people. It's a huge number for television. Because it is even financed by the British public. They pay yearly annual fees for the BBC uh, and the annual income is 5 billion pounds it's a huge, huge, huge money so they are just sacrificing it for journalists and 600 million is subsidies from the government I get that just to exemplify you that a sort of western look may be so uh, hypocritical you know in the last events, or in Egypt, etc., Syria, in Turkey, in Kashmir, everywhere. Okay, now when you look at this picture, we are now coming to the second question. Where am I? We are in the world, clearly. So this is the map of the world. But there is a trick with this map. Let me see if you can find it. There is a country which, which has drawn this map for the first time in history, a depiction of the world. This is not the world, as you know. If you think this is the world, it's wrong. Because the world is a sphere, isn't it? I mean, it's not a paper like this. And, and the world's shape is not that. It's not a rectangular world, we are living. But that country is so tricky, they put themselves at the center of the map. So the, the center of the world is that country. Which country is that? Yeah, Britain. So when was this map drawn, do you think? When can it be? 18th century. Yeah. When was the peak of the British power? Colonial the power, they were just eating up everything, huh? 19th century. 1860s. So during the Victorian time. So this map was drawn by the British. It's a British world. It is not your world. 
while they are at the center. They force you to think of the space that we are living in the eyes of a British. So be careful with your space considerations. When you discuss the things, be careful. And it is such a, a strange thing, actually, because when you look at the right hand, the Bering Strait, for example, and the Alaska on the left hand, they are actually united. But in this uh, map, you see them as worlds apart, as if they have no connection. Isn't it? So it just distorts. Be careful with the uh, depictions of space. They always carry a value. They always carry a prejudice. Another example. This is also a world, isn't it? It's also a map in the same projection. But then, now the center has shifted somewhere else. Which country is that? Which country? And this is the map that country has in public offices and in the schools. Not the other one. They don't use the other one. Or mention one, but they use this one. When you look at the right in the middle, a vertical line, when you draw just in the middle, you find that country because it is in the center. Japan. Sorry? Japan. Japan, yeah. This is a Japanese depiction of the world. And when you what what I mean what does it matter? I and mean, why do we bother about whose world is it? I mean, does it really matter? We can live with the maps, isn't it? Yeah? I don't think so. <laughs> because when you stick to any envisioning of the space, you are actually constructing that space yourself. You are serving to that construction. Let's see. For example, this is another very historical map. Which country is the center? China. China, this time. And it is no coincidence that I don't know Chinese. Anybody knows Chinese? So, yeah. How do they call China in their, in Chinese? Zhongguo. This is, this is right? Right. Yeah. And it means middle country? Yeah. Okay. Then I'm fine. Right. <laughs> because I, I took it from Gossip. It's not really for me. Okay. Then, even back in the old times, this is I think from three or four hundred uh, BC, uh, sorry, AD. So the Chinese they call their country middle country. Zhongguo meant middle country, central country. So all the people they are actually straight themselves at the center of the world, and this is a. Uh, a world map from an Islamic source. This is also historical. And what is the center of the world? Mecca. 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 Uh, in all parts of the Islamic world, historically, the maps were drawn as the Kaaba as the center. It is no wonder, because what you believe situates yourself in the world. How you believe situates yourself in the world. So there is a very strong relation between identity and space. Belief and space. And when we look at this region that we have now, how do we call it? Middle East. Middle East. East of which country? Because I am in the Middle East. So it is not my middle and it's not my east. <laughs> I am at my home. So who is describing my home? According to which country am I in the Middle East? Britain. Britain, again. And uh, what is the Far East, not the Middle but Far East? Which country is that, for example? Which region? China, China, China Japan, and Southeast Asia. Okay, so when we discuss Middle East politics, actually, what are we discussing? We are discussing the issues from the viewpoint of the British. Or the West. So we have to be careful. For example, in Turkey, there are many stupid uh, friends who discuss about 
being Middle East, I mean Middle East being a bloody place, you know, we have to get out of this place. Okay, then move to Britain. <laughs> this is the center. But then you can understand that this verb itself carries a very heavy burden. And the people there unconsciously, as I told you in the beginning, because of our consciousness of the space that we are living in, our own space, our own depiction of the world, we are referring ourselves as the Middle East. Saying that you know, the Middle East is a very tough place. You know, it's a very difficult place. There are big problems. But then we are still talking about Middle East. It's not Middle East. It is your neighborhood. It is your place. You know. So therefore, uh, we have to be careful how we understand and place ourselves in this space. Okay. Then, we can also adopt different ways to look at the geography. And this gives you a historical understanding as well. When you look at the physical uh, stature, positioning of the continents or the regions, they suggest you a history actually. You don't, you don't have to know any history. For example, I'm not an expert of European history, let's say. And I look at this map, what, what do we see? Mountains, fields, plains, rivers, isn't it? seas and lakes. Okay, let's imagine, but this is a depiction, the world is not like that, it's not a vertical thing like that. Actually, on the world uh, sphere, this map is like this, isn't it? It's an obscure it's not like this. So even this is a distortion. But let's think that I turn upside down the European physical map, now I strip myself Many, many centuries ago, I was living in here, let's say in Norway, in this Norway. It's a very cold place, isn't it? I don't want to be there. But then, I'm living there, and I'm a Viking. And then suddenly, we fell hungry. So we are looking for some food. So where do, where do you move without knowing any history? Because you can just estimate. You move southward, isn't it? Why is it warmer? It is warmer and it is more fertile, for sure. And then when you move here, you can go down, up until where? These mountain chain. You cannot cross that chain because you don't have the airplane, the car, and the tunnels. So these up mountains, when you arrive there, you stop. Isn't it? And when you see that mountain chain, how do you react? Where do you go? You couldn't, you know, trust, uh, cross it. So where do you go? Right and left, where there are passages. And this is really the, the movement of the uh, Germanic tribes during, for example, the first century. So without knowing history, you can just look at the geography and presume some history. So this, this was how they moved really. So they couldn't pass through Italy, for example, because of the Alps, but they went towards France and Balkans. And we said the third question of consciousness was about history. Let's imagine we think of history as the CVs of people or nations. So when you apply for a job, we usually ask a CV. To see what? A CV is what, actually? A person's history. It's your history. That's why in our old language, we would call it as the ayat, the life's itinerary, something. So just imagine there are three civilizations which are applying for a world uh, affinity, a word, uh, how do you say, appearance. So they are playing that we will become a world civilization. On the left hand, you have only two volumes of CV, of a civilization. In the middle, there are, I don't know what, ten volumes, and on the right hand, you have three volumes. 
which civilizations they may be. Looking at their volumes, how much they achieve, isn't it? CV shows you, shows your achievements as well. So, for example, on the left hand, two volumes refers to what? Which country, for example, this civilization? When you think of the civilization, human history as a whole. No, when you look at it, for example, in the middle, it is the Islamic civilization, isn't it? It's not a novice one, it's not a new one, it's not a rookie civilization. It has been always there. But when you look at the modern British, for example, it's on the left, or in the American. And on the right hand, you have a bit older one, let's say the British. So, when you start thinking of history as, own, as your own history, then you start to understand history better. History is the real life. It's not some abstract past thing. So therefore, as much achievements as you do, you are actually in a stronger position to build the future. So we have to start as Muslims to understand our history as a united history, not as a countries or regions or states history, isn't it? And in our civilizational history, anyway, you see many, many figures who migrated coming from Indonesia to Arabian Peninsula or from Balkans to Turkey or from Turkey to Baghdad from Baghdad to Iran, etc. from Central Asia, like Imam Bukhari, for example coming to uh, Arabia, uh, Baghdad, etc. So when we look at the, our achievements in the world actually you see there are not a few I just gave some examples. For example, the numbers that we are using now, like the page number we put here, how do we call it in English? Arabic numerals. Why? Because those numbers, the Westerners took from the Muslims. And cipher, which means zero also, comes from the Muslims. So we don't think, we shouldn't think that history belongs to the past. History is today, otherwise we wouldn't be talking about it. If it is finished, why do you talk about it? It is something which is not finished. Just like our own lives. When I talked about my past in the beginning, well, I, mean, I didn't really uh, think that I am a dead man. Because it makes me live, actually, what is behind me. So, therefore, we have to feel that strength. These are just very few things, I mean, words. And the word admiral, for example, comes from which language? Prince of the sea, uh, Amir al -Bah. Exactly. From Arabic, Amir al -Bah. Amir al Bravo. And alcohol, the same thing, from Arabic. So, it actually shows you how much interrelated the past with the present. These are just a few uh, examples. So history is an asset, it is not a burden. We Muslims everywhere, we are taught that history is a very boring thing. You know, don't really go into it. Leave it present day. Because what is valuable is today. Do something about today. But you cannot do something about today without knowing your past. Just like that lady lying in the hospital bed and asking the question, what happened to me? If you don't know what happened to the Islamic Ummah, you cannot be in the future. If you don't know that the world map that you are using is a British one, you cannot evaluate geography. If you don't know that your identity is your faith, nothing else, not your race, not your locality, and this is the uniqueness of Islam, it opens you all the geography, all the spaces, all the times, and all the identities. Islam is the one which opens up, which doesn't close. So we don't have any kind of enclosure in our history. For example, ghettos don't exist in the Islamic world. Why? You know what ghetto is? It's a high wall, uh, a reservation. Inside the cities, in Eastern Europe and Central Europe, where the Jews could live, they couldn't live outside. 
in the city. And when the sun set, they had to be inside the walls. The doors were locked up. They were just like an open uh, space, an open air prison. But that structure you cannot find in any Islamic city. Although the Jews live in Istanbul, everywhere, in North Africa, etc. Why we don't close up? We always open up. That's why when we conquer uh, a town, we call it Al Pet. Isn't it? You open it up. Isn't it interesting? I mean, you actually grab that place. Grabbing is closing, actually. You have it and you grab, you close it. But then we just say the opposite. We say no, we open it up. Sultan Fatih Muhammad, he opened up his town. So this is the difference, a very cognitive difference that we have. So the Muslim is an open one. And we think of history as the history of openness. Which human beings, which different uh, types of human beings and cultures have been opened up? Which uh, regions have been opened up? Which practices have been opened up? So we have to think in those terms. And history is not yesterday, it's today. History builds future, you know, very well. And you cannot escape from history. For example, Turkey has stayed away since the end of Ottoman Empire from all previous lands. With the Lausanne Treaty, actually, we promised it to the Western powers. We said, well, we won't really take care of any other Muslim. We will just close up in our own territory. It will be a republic. We will do our own business. We won't have any business with the Syrians, with the Iraqis, with the Iranians, or the Balkans, etc. As if they are very foreign people, or they are living in other universe. Actually, the same kind of people you have in Turkey are the same kind of people you have in Syria, etc. All the region, Balkans, etc. But then, when the time comes, even though you deny your history, it imposes itself upon yourself. Bosnian War was an eye-opener for many of the Turkish intellectuals. Because they were always thinking that the West is a very nice civilization, we have to follow them. They are very humanistic, etc. But when they see that the Western powers actually co-opted, massacred Muslims and mass raiding of Muslim women in Bosnia, they were really shocked. Some of them, some of, some of them are still in coma. At home. They are in good sleep. The death will uh, wake them up, as the Hadith says. So. You cannot escape from history. Those Muslim Muslims, they were always making up the lies every day, do you know that? Under the Serbian uh, attacks, they were just making up rumors among themselves, saying that the Turkish fighter jets will arrive today and they will bomb the Serbs and we will be safe. Even though they knew that it wasn't true. Just to give the morale. Can you imagine? So, even if you turn your eye from Bosnia, from Syria, will come upon it. And I wish we had to be, I mean, we were as historically minded as the Western, Western people. They still live in history. They care about history. So we have to be very careful about that. We have to know the value of our history. And power comes into picture once you know where you are, what you have done, and who you are. Then you say, I have a business in the world. So I have some sort of power. I have to have some power. Well, there is a game in town, as they say. And that game is a real politic game. It's a hard power game. They can just look at your face without any shame and claim that they are representing the truth, and the democracy, and human rights. And at the same time, they are misarching your own people. So this kind of creature is a new one in human history. Do you know that? But it is thanks to secular modernity which created such uh, divided, uh, monstrous human beings. Before the lies were lies, they were sincere lies. You were lying in the web, everybody called it lie. But now the lies 
have become 